I have to say it is really a pleasure and an honor and just a sheer joy to be here today after all these years of talking about it, as Kalyan just mentioned, and to get to see just a little bit of India, finally. It's a big, big place, and I've been to more or less every continent, yeah, to every continent, but I had not been to this subcontinent, and it's a very big place, and I look forward to seeing more of it. So this evening, it's uh, certainly a great honor to be uh, here to wrap up the show, so to speak. And I would like to do this by giving you a little, a quick world tour of some of my adventures in wildlife photography. And I like to call this capturing elusive wonders. All of us are capturing elusive wonders because when we press the shutter, if we press it at the right time, we hope that we have captured something of that is wonderful, of a natural wonder, and it is usually elusive because those moments tend to last very little time. So unlike movies, it's about capturing that very peak moment when the motion is at its perfect and when we want to actually preserve that particular instance. So that's why I call it capturing elusive moments, elusive wonders. But to me, just going back to basics, I didn't attend any kind of photography course. Actually, I never attended school. I was uh, taught at home by my mother. And so to me, photography is all about seeing. It's our strongest sense. And it's about seeing the world around us. And of course, it's about all those animals that we try to photograph. And I'd like to think that there are as many different ways of seeing as there are eyes out there. Not just us seeing, but each one of us has a different way of seeing, and each one of them, the denizens of this world, has a different way of seeing. So it's kind of about them, how they see us, the animals, how they see us, how we see them, how they see each other, or maybe don't want to see each other. But for me as a photographer, it really, my photography started innocently and spontaneously. I was not in pursuit of anything in particular. I just wanted to see the world the way the animals around me saw, that, saw it. And really, what I wanted to do was to put myself behind their lens, behind their eyes. And that's what I've been doing now for very nearly 50 years. And to try and imagine, to see the world the way they do, to try to fly with the albatross over the ocean and try to capture that feeling, to try to be part of the elephant herd. No, I didn't take that picture my, up close. I had a remote release and uh, placed my camera in the salt lake. But uh, it's really about trying to follow the lives of these wild animals, try to understand how they go about living their lives, and try to follow them through that life. Actually, when I was 16, I think, I had thought I'd want to become an ornithologist. And then I realized that really I, I wanted to flit, fly around more and not necessarily focus very hard on any one thing. But rather, I decided I wanted to capture the full life cycle on camera of all of the 62 or 64 bird species nesting in the Galapagos Islands. That seemed innocent enough. but. Here I am, 50 years later, I haven't completed the project yet. But really, I've, I've uh, had great opportunities um, to go out and about in many different ways, sometimes working on tourist ships, uh, joining scientists, whichever way I could find, go out and about around the world, and to, as I said, to try to peek into the world of these animals. When a blue whale is sounding, I'd like to try and follow it as far as I can and see what's happening down there, what they're doing. Actually, this blue whale transformed into a fin whale because my underwater blue whale photos didn't work out. It was too murky. But uh, that's just a detail. So let's go back to the Galapagos Islands where, for me, it all started. Actually, I was born in Belgium, in Brussels. My parents were city people, and they decided they wanted to become pioneers. They wanted to... Um, leave the, the war-torn Europe behind. And um, in 1955, they packed up 
their few belongings and headed off to the Galapagos Islands to become pioneers. And really, this was pioneering. Here we are, homesteading in the forest, in a tent that my mother had sewn beforehand to live in. And so my early years uh, as a child was really helping my father put food on the table, go out at sea, catch fish, lobsters, every once in a great while a sea turtle would change the menu. But more than anything, I had a chance to really get to know my natural surroundings, to become part of that, those surroundings, and to start to understand how the animals around me lived. And that really was the launching pad for what would become my lifelong love of nature and wildlife and my involvement in photography. My father was quite fascinated by photography himself. He took some black and white films and chemicals with him to Galapagos and would process his film in the sea. We had very limited amount of fresh water, um, but it worked. And so that's what those early black and white photos are. And for me, well, I started borrowing his camera. And then when I was 16, I got my own SLR and started to photograph more seriously trying to capture the essence of the islands, the active volcanoes and the wildlife that's there. And that gave rise to one of my, my classic book on the Galapagos Islands that has actually been in print for very nearly 20 years. I've done actually a number of books. I could say that several more titles were born of that fire because uh, with different titles. But I'll show you a few pictures of the Galapagos Islands just to give you a feeling of what the the, the essence of the place. It is a timeless place because people have never lived there historically, or at least the history of humans in Galapagos is very, very recent. So these islands really were allowed to, to exist much longer than most parts of the world in their complete natural balance. So therefore, we have wildlife there that is completely unique. And unlike most other islands in the world, basically, no species have been lost yet, or very few. Only one uh, bird species, and it's a, it's a very near species to another one that's still there. What's actually challenging photographically is to actually capture that essence. The giant Galapagos tortoise is the icon species there. These animals can grow up to, to weigh about 250 kilos. They are quite large. but it's not just a picture of a tortoise that I want. What I wanted to do was to show how tortoises live, how they relate to each other, how they relate to the species around them, how they relate to their environment, how they go through the different seasons. This is on an active volcano, well, rather a dormant volcano, and we're looking across the crater of the volcano, which fills up with clouds in the morning, and to capture these uh, different seasonal lights and the life cycle of these animals. But um, in actual fact, the islands can be quite challenging to photograph because they are very contrasted. They're very stark in many places. The wildlife is varied and abundant, but it's not very colorful for the most part. But what I've always tried to do is to actually kept try and capture the essence of an image that shows what the islands are about, what not just one of the species, not just the volcano, but the animals in their environment. And that may sound easy, but it's actually, it doesn't very often come together. So I've spent many, many years trying to get these kinds of images where you can actually feel how the animals exist and what their greater world is like. So these are just a few examples. The last one was a, a land iguana in a volcanic caldera. This is a blue-footed booby on the coastline. A Galapagos hawk in another volcano where there are active uh, um, sulfur fumaroles. And once again, a volcanic eruption. You can, you can get photos of volcanoes erupting in many places in the world. And you can get pictures of pelicans and marine iguanas any day if you're in Galapagos. But very rarely can you actually get the two together. And yet, it's those two elements together that make those islands so special. In Galapagos, we even have birds who've basically lost their wings and crabs that have outshone all the other animals. It's really a place of a lot of contrast, such as sea lions and flamingos in the same view. A lot of harmony, 
in the display of the blue-footed booby. A lot of peace as this tortoise waiting for the rains. Incredible fragility all around you. Always this delicate life starting and struggling and ending. And the family scene of one of the most iconic birds, again, the blue-footed booby. So how to illustrate that? How to capture that in a way that isn't just a snapshot? Well, very early on, I, I realized that the best way to show the animals, not only in their habitat, but also to get into their level, into their world. Now, this is nothing new. Many of you do that. But it's amazing how many people don't photograph at the eye level of the animals. And it gives a very different impression. So that's the kind of examples of what I've tried to do. Likewise, trying to photograph the marine iguanas. It's the only place in the world where these iguanas go into the sea to feed on seaweed. So here I'm trying to brace myself in the wave wash to get a picture of the marine iguana emerging from the wave as it uh, drains away. Likewise, underwater. To really take pictures of an animal in its environment, you have to get into its environment and be part of it and be, be in that same atmosphere to show how they go about their lives. I started by climbing trees in a fairly basic way, using my bare toes uh, to photograph one of the 13 species of Darwin's finches feeding on these seasonal flowers in this uh, wild native tree. But many years later, I took that kind of uh, concept a little bit further. And that's when I started to travel more and more widely, going to Indonesia, visiting a friend there. And uh, we just had a very good uh, show of how you climb trees professionally. Now, these are big trees. These are trees you wouldn't, I wouldn't want to climb with my toes. Um, photographing the uh, red-knobbed hornbill in the northern part of Sulawesi. Doing the same thing again in um, the Amazon in Peru to photograph a harpy eagle nest. In this case, I was uh, 46 meters up in a Brazil nut tree to try and get level with the eagle's nest. And in fact, I ended up changing position and getting into the same tree as the eagle and sitting on an outer branch nine meters away from the, from the nest trying to, be, to hide in a blind, then realizing the eagle was perfectly aware that I was there. So I took the blind down, and it made no difference. Also, on the same trip, I was lucky enough to photograph the um, king vulture, which is actually even rarer than a harpy eagle to find a nest. So that was really quite a, a remarkable trip to get both species. But all of this really stemmed from my initial uh, contact and habits that I developed in the Galapagos Islands, where I found that the best way, for me at least, to photograph nature is to be very, very basic, very minimalistic out there. I don't use assistance. I don't uh, have backup. When you climb a volcano like this in Galapagos, yeah, there is no water there, so you have to carry your own for as long as, for as, long as you can stay, which is only a few days which means you take absolutely nothing superfluous, no spare clothes, just the most basic, and I mean basic, of food, um, your sleeping gear, and not much else. But that has really helped me to feel very free wherever else I go. This is a, a winter camping trip I did in the upper parts of uh, one of the New Zealand subantarctic islands. I'll tell you more about that later, but I'm just uh, enjoying myself on my own in my little one-man tent, or one-woman tent, I suppose it is. And here an opportunity, not quite so basic because I was on a cruise ship, but photographing penguins in the blizzard in Antarctica. There's really nothing that I enjoy more than to wake up in the morning, unzip my tent, and look out at this scene which is just, that to me is heaven. Being out there all on my own in my little tiny tent and having the animals come up to my door to see what's going on inside. <laughs> of course, I took my habit of getting down low and personal with the animals from Galapagos to other places where they are trusting. And they are, of course, much more trusting when you're down low. Animals don't like just like we don't particularly feel comfortable with something that's taller than us. They much prefer to look down at you, and that arises, arouses a lot of curiosity. And it, I think, gets you the better pictures. 
And of course, also, as I've traveled, I've tried to continue in searching for opportunities to photograph the greater environment in which these animals are, not necessarily an up-close and personal view, but rather the wide view from the Antarctic to the Arctic whenever I've had the opportunity. As I said, some of these very remote places, the only way I've been able to access them was by working on, on tour vessels as a boat driver and a lecturer and naturalist. But uh, that was certainly great opportunities. And of course, quite a few places in between that are a little more accessible than that. So how do I work? I've almost, I've only twice in my life ever worked on an assignment. I find that going into the wilderness with a shopping list makes me uncomfortable, as much as it is very nice to have all your expenses covered. I generally, if I can possibly manage it, I prefer to just go out there and uh, not necessarily alone, maybe with one companion. I did this for 20 odd years with my life partner, but he's no longer with me now. And um, to go out there and search for the rare South American maned wolf in Brazil, in the Mato Grosso Plateau, an absolutely astounding animal, completely adapted to the tall grasslands in which it lives, a solitary wolf, the only large canid in South America, and over a period of a month, I was actually able to habituate this animal to get it completely comfortable with my presence at very close range. Interestingly enough, in this case, I was with my partner, who was also a photographer, and with, another, with a local Brazilian photographer. She, this was a female. She did not particularly like the guys, but she was completely comfortable with me. So that was lucky for me. I could walk alongside her when she was hunting. They feed on uh, rodents and birds and fruit. And here's a bird that got away. And of course, that gave me the chance to be there for the perfect golden light. But not all projects work out quite as well as that. Another expedition was searching for other rare and mythical animals. I tend to like to look for something that's a little mysterious, that we don't know everything about. In this case, the spectacled bear and woolly mountain tapir in the Andes. In this case, I uh, went along with a ragtag group of guys. The, the two guys in the middle were local, um, local guys who knew the mountains very well. This is where the Andes drops off into the Amazon in um, Ecuador. And we were set off into this extremely wet environment, into completely trackless landscapes with deep valleys and ridges and lots of rain and clouds looking for these animals that they had seen, but are very rarely seen and even more rarely photographed. It was a week-long expedition, and well, we found tapir droppings, tapir tracks, wool, um, bear scratch marks in the trees, and that was it. This is the bear that I was hoping to see. This is a captive animal that I photographed in Peru, and this was a photo that the local chap Patricio had taken on a little camera of the woolly mountain tapir. But we never saw either one of them. What we did see was plenty of rain, continuous rain. It rained basically non-stop for a week, except it did stop. And that's when it started to snow. So we were at about uh, between, we started at over 4,000 meters elevation and then dropped down into the valley and eventually joined the road down below at about 3,200, I think. But anyway, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It was still a good experience. And uh, now I'd like to tell you a little more about some of my other book projects that some of these adventures have led to. Having done several books in Galapagos was a very good launching platform. I might say, oddly enough, there has never been another resident photographer in the Galapagos Islands, which is really quite surprising. So. That gave me an excellent chance to get started there. But from there, I went on to do other books, sometimes co-authored, sometimes not. And the middle one is the, the book that I was working on when I met Kalyan in Kenya. But um, this book on the Andes was one that I dreamt about for 25 years, because I started traveling in the Andes in the early 70s. And it took me 25 years to accumulate the photos of the wild Andes, all the way from the equator down to, um, to Cape Horn, basically. 
And so I called the book As the Condor Flies, because where the condor flies is where the wilderness is in the mountains, mountain chain of South America. There's one canyon in Peru that is twice as deep as the Grand Canyon of Colorado, where there are plenty of condors. And of course, they go all the way down to the tip of Chile. So the book shows a lot of contrasts, um, traveling to these different places, active volcanoes in, uh, near the equator, frozen landscapes further south, the um, tropical uh, cloud forests also in the equatorial region and then further south going into desert country in Peru and Chile. Further south in Chile, the uh, Araucaria forests. Uh, here this is in wintertime. And finally, a shot of Patagonia, famous mountain range, Fitzroy, and a few of the animals that uh, are found along the way. This is the Viscacha, a funny looking animal that looks like a cross between a rabbit and a squirrel that lives in the high mountains. Um, the Peruvian cock of the rock in the tropical Andes, along with the plate-billed mountain toucan, one of the many, many, many species, especially dozens of species of hummingbirds in this environment. So that's just a very quick little snapshot of that project. And then, 25 years ago, I moved to New Zealand. It was an accident. I went to visit some friends. I was still with my partner then. We um, enjoyed the place. We drove around, and we were there for five weeks. And in the last week, we actually bought a property and applied for residency. And the rest was history, as they say. So uh, we didn't think we were going to get it. We thought we didn't have a very clear profession as photographers and occasional tour guides. So we thought, well, they said, apply. It may take years. Just try it out. In nine months, we had our visa, and so we moved. And just like the tortoise is the icon species in Galapagos, in New Zealand, the icon species is the kiwi. New Zealand, sadly, has lost most of its spectacular wildlife, which were all birds, many of them gigantic, bigger than ostriches. But they all went extinct when humans arrived there about 800 years ago from the Polynesian region, when the Maoris settled in New Zealand. The only ones that are left are quite small and secretive, like the kiwi. And uh, so, of course, the kiwi had to be on the cover. And the book, like all my books, was about the nature of the country, from the volcanoes of the North Island to the glaciers of South Island of New Zealand, from the West Coast rainforests to the East Coast calm and sheltered bays. Not always calm, but sometimes. And the southern fjordland region, which is rain-soaked, storm-lashed part of the South Island. So the book went from habitat to habitat, starting with the high country. I noticed that many, there are many books on New Zealand about the landscapes, and there are guidebooks about the wildlife, but there was actually no book that showed the natural history of the country, of the, the, the entire nature of New Zealand. So that's what I dedicated myself to in this book, showing what actually lives there. This is the kia, which is a snow parrot. It lives above tree line um, in the fell fields and the, the open country high up in the mountains. A little bit lower in the uh, valleys in the mountains is another remarkable flightless bird of New Zealand, which was believed to be extinct for many years, but was rediscovered. It's a giant moorhen, the takahe and it is now increasing under protection. Forest borderlands, the, the margins are an excellent place for some of the remaining bird life, such as my namesake. This is the Tui, or the New Zealanders would say the Tui. It's spelt the same way, but uh, it's a coincidence. My parents didn't know that uh, this bird existed when they chose my name. They'd read about a person with that name. But the real heart of New Zealand are the deep, lush, forests. These are the subtropical forests of New Zealand, hardwood forests, uh, and with a tremendous variety of tree species as well as ferns. Very, very, very wet forests, and that is the home of the kiwi. Now, kiwi are not usually seen, by the way, the New Zealand way of naming birds is not to pluralize it with an S. So many kiwi are still kiwi, but anyway. Um, 
These birds are not usually seen in the daytime, but this happened to be an individual that was studied by some researchers that was a little bit territorial. So when he heard footprints, footsteps, he would come out of his burrow. They dig burrows and sleep in the burrows in the daytime. And he would come out and see what was going on. So great photo opportunity. This is a little bit more typical of Kiwi habitat in the very deep, rain-drenched undergrowth. If you ever wanted to design an animal that was not easy to photograph, you would probably seek something that was nocturnal, gray, had extremely good sense of smell, good sense of hearing, was very shy, runs very fast, or freezes, and then dives into a burrow. And there are many mammals that qualify for that description, but so does the kiwi. There is one place in New Zealand where kiwi sometimes come out onto the beach to eat some of the grubs that develop in the washed up seaweed. So this was the place where I was actually able to photograph the birds feeding. And you can see its eye is actually closed. Its eyesight is not that important, but it has long whiskers like a rodent to feel um, its way around. It, it has nostrils at the tip of its beak and it can plunge its beak all the way down into the sand or the earth to dig out worms and insects. Here's another example of a New Zealand bird. It's called, the native name is Kokako, and uh, the English name is organ bird because it has such an extraordinary song, also very much endangered. All of the birds, the native birds in New Zealand are endangered to some degree because of the introduction of mammals which never existed in New Zealand, rats, cats, pigs, and in particular, stoats, mustelids, that were introduced for the fur trade, were introduced to control rabbits, and that has really caused disasters for all of these endemic birds. Even a parakeet, which is surprising in a re relatively temperate climate, a forest falcon, similar to a, a peregrine, but it's actually the smaller animals in the forest that are really fascinating. This is a little frog, also endangered, but very, very primitive, very ancient species. Lots of very remarkable insects, such as these very colored stick insects that can be about um, 15 centimeters long. The largest of all insects is a great big cricket, which uh, can be as heavy as a small songbird. Here's a, a slug with the design of a leaf a land snail that feeds on other animals. It's carnivorous. It actually is a predator. It feeds on worms and uh, insects. And then the prize of all prizes, this extraordinary parrot. It's the largest parrot of the world. It's called the kakapo. It's uh, completely nocturnal and completely flightless. It runs around on the ground with big whiskers to feel its way around in the understory. It can climb trees as well. And it was once down to, I think, the lowest number was 16 individuals, the prey of, uh, of the introduced mammals. So for many years, there's been conservation projects going on um, breeding these birds, and it's very rare to get permission to actually photograph them. So I was very lucky here when I was working on my book to be able to go to, want to the, the breeding place. This, these birds were semi-wild. They had been hand-reared. They had been rescued from nests where they were failing. They were like the second hatch chick. So they were rescued and hand-raised, and they were getting ready to be released. So they were in a very large natural enclosure, but they were used to seeing people. That was the best, the easiest uh, opportunity for getting shots at night. When you get down to the coastline, the forest plunges straight into the sea in many places, except, of course, where agriculture has pushed back the forest, but where the shoreline is steep, you still get the natural forest. And on the west coast, especially, you get this bird, which, of course, is also a surprise, a penguin nesting in the forest. It's called the Fjordland Crested Penguin. And this is Fjordland, the southern wild regions of New Zealand. So that gives you a little glimpse of the country where I moved to after uh, growing up in the Galapagos Islands. But from there, I was able to go around and do some other book projects. And here is indeed where I met Kalyan. Right here, in fact, I took this picture from the very terrace where we met, because this was right in front of the house of a mutual friend, the director of the research station. And that eventually 
turned into a book about Lycipia. The one I have one sample back here on um, at the back, but it has a different cover because there were two different editions for different uses. But it was quite a challenge to go to a place that has been so photographed as East Africa has been. Therefore, I had never been there to photograph prior because I really didn't know what, how to photograph this place that would be different than what everybody else had already done. So when I set out to do this book, which they asked me to do, this was a book to promote the highlands of Kenya, the Laikipia Plateau between Mount Kenya and the, and the Great Rift Valley, I thought, well, obviously I need to show the predators that everybody loves, but really I need to show this place in a different kind of way, in a way that gives a feeling that this is a particular part of Kenya, a particular, particular part of East Africa, not just another view of the whole landscape there, of the whole, or rather of the whole menagerie of animals. So that's Mount Kenya that dominates the Laikipia Plateau, and it really is an iconic view of that particular region here with a herd of oryx in the foreground. So I tried to concentrate on the more secretive side, on the, on the animals, how they live, how they hunt, um, you know, the nightfall. And of course, I went back to getting down low because even a gigantic giraffe looks very different when you get right down at ground level. And because this is not a national park, these are private lands, private wildlife reserves, um, I was able to do this for the purpose of the book, getting out of the vehicle, getting down low, and getting different angles. This is a view of a, of a young hyena that was quite curious and playful, and so I gradually slipped out of the vehicle at nightfall and laid in the grass and just illuminated it with a hand torch. This is not a flash picture. It was just the, the hyena was looking at me fascinated and was quite still, and uh, so I could just light paint it. I also wanted to get elephants at water level. But that was, I must admit, a little bit scary. Now, if you notice here, there is a green blob. That's me under a little camouflage cloth on a little island in the middle of a little reservoir. And I thought, well, it's kind of far away, I think. And the, the owner of the, the ranch said, yeah, that should be fine. But I can assure you that when you're down here, and the elephant is up there. It looks very big and very threatening, and it could smell me. It knew I was there somewhere, but it didn't see me. So uh, yeah, that was a bit of a scary moment, I must admit. The other challenge for me with that book was that I was asked to also include the lovely native people of the region. And I'm not a people photographer. I don't feel comfortable pointing a lens at people. And so I wanted to capture the spirit of how they live as well. But it was, it, it made me nervous, but I was quite happy in the end that they were relaxed. And so I relaxed. And these are the Samburu girls, just lovely, lovely people. And also how the people share the landscape. We had a tremendous amount of rain in what is otherwise a very dry country. And so this was an opportunity to really get the bigger picture, the view of that enormous big landscape with the people living in it. I also found that the best photos for me work best when I'm just on my own. So on my third visit, I convinced everyone that I really wanted to just have the vehicle, no guide, no driver, just let me go out there and do my own thing, which they agreed to. And so uh, the giraffes thought it was very entertaining to see this, uh, this tourist changing tires at regular intervals because I was allowed to drive off road for the purpose of the book. but. Uh, there were a lot of punctures. <laughs> but it, it enabled me to go out at night, because again, we're on private land. I was driving off-road at night. Sometimes I was literally um, orienting myself by frog, which was because there were a couple of palms with frogs singing. And that was my only cue to where the road was to get back. <laughs> so this is a vulture against the full moon. And then I need to tell the story of this little animal, because this is all very nice kind of personal experiences. But the purpose of all of my books has been to bring up the consciousness of the fragility of places, the need to preserve them better, the beauty, and also the problems. And one day I was driving on my own, and I met this gentleman. And he was very big and very photogenic. 
So I stopped the car, and he was walking towards me. Now, most elephants, they've seen cars before. They walk towards you, and then they walk around the car. Well, it became quite obvious that he wasn't going to walk around the car. So I kept on shooting. The pictures got better and better, but he accelerated. As you can see, the dust is flying. He didn't really charge, but he just came very determinedly at me. So I thought, right, I better back up here. So I'm backing up with one hand and still taking pictures with the other, and back the car up against a tree. And he kept coming. So he lowered his head, put his two gigantic tusks under the side of the car, and lifted it, and then just ripped the side of the car off, the metal, just peeled it off, peeled the snorkel off the side of the windscreen right next to where I was driving, and walked away. And it turned out that this animal was called Mountain Bull and is a very famous elephant. And he was called Mountain Bull because he was the only elephant left in Laikipia who refused to accept that elephants could no longer migrate up to the high flanks of Mount Kenya during the dry season to go into the green forest there because between Laikipia and Mount Kenya, under those clouds, you can see the tip of Mount Kenya there, but behind all those clouds is a belt of agriculture that has expanded and expanded. It's a very rich, very productive area with big wheat fields, big flower farms that export cut flowers to Europe. And so there are more and more electric fences to stop the elephants from coming through. But Mountain Bull refused to accept that. So he kept tearing through the electric fences, getting shot at. He had every reason to hate humans. And yet, he came over and said, get out of my way. He could have killed me with a flick of his trunk, but he didn't. He just walked away. And I just felt like, in a strange way, I'd received the blessing from an animal that deserved, that should have wanted to see me and all humankind removed from the landscape. And he inspired an amazing project, because 14 farms got together and gave up strips of their land and uh, a huge donation came from Virgin, uh, from Richard Branson, to create an elephant-sized underpass under the main highway to recreate a corridor for the elephants to go up to Mount Kenya again. And within a month, they all started using it. And a few months later, Mountain Bull, with his big tusks, was such a great target for not only for irate farmers who would shoot at him, but for poachers for his ivory, that they tranquilized him, took three quarters of his tusks off to make him less agile at breaking fences and less desirable for poachers. A month later, he was killed. So he was an inspiration, and I felt blessed that I met him, but he didn't live very long. Anyway, I know that I'm taking you late into the night, and I must accelerate here. So I'll take you to another project, two projects. And these really, it's a twin project, let's say. This is the biggest project that I've ever undertaken, was the twin books on albatrosses of the world and penguins of the world. Now, most people think of the albatross, a huge seabird that hardly anybody sees. There's actually 22 species of albatrosses. They all come out of the same mold but they're all quite different, and of course, they all live different lifestyles in different parts of the world. But what they all share in common is a desire to stay far away from land most of the time. And penguins, there's 18 of them, so not as quite as many as albatrosses, but they too are not seen every day unless you live in a place like the Falkland Islands. So both these types of birds spend most of their lives way out at sea, in the case of albatrosses, they're scavengers. They range over enormous areas, flying almost continuously just to find food, scraps of food. They argue with other seabirds to do so. And as scavengers, they're greatly attracted to vessels, fishing vessels out in the open ocean. And I wanted to bring attention to these birds that nobody hears about or very little and to show what actually happens to them out there. But I wanted to show it also in a beautiful way. A tremendous number of albatrosses die by getting tangled in fishing lines, by getting caught on fish hooks, getting drowned by cables from trawlers, etc., because they are attracted to fishing vessels. Other albatrosses die from 
plastic flotsam in the ocean. This is a chick on uh, Midway Atoll in, um, in Hawaii where it never reached adulthood because the parents brought so much food, so much plastic back in their stomachs with their food to feed the chicks that they absolutely fill up with plastic before they fledge. Penguins, too, range mostly far and wide. Some penguins are quite resident. Uh, penguins in the Arctic range with the sea ice. Other penguins actually travel out into the ocean and stay there for many months. But because they don't fly, they're in the water all the time, they're completely vulnerable to shipping, and mainly oil. When a ship runs aground, in this case it's a container ship in New Zealand, or a tanker even worse, and oil is released into the sea, the penguins can't get away. They get covered in oil and die in short order. In some places, even coastal development has taken over penguin habitat. So those are the issues that I wanted to introduce, but I wanted to introduce it by producing something beautiful and then also showing the other side. So that's how those, the, the reason for those two books. But flipping through it a little more quickly, albatrosses are the largest flying birds in the world with a wingspan of up to 3.1 meters. And this gives you an idea of the size of an albatross. That's an albatross footprint. And that's my hand next to it, just to give you a sense of scale. The way they fly requires very, very little energy, so they can cover thousands of kilometers just by using the wind and the energy of the wind and the waves. They can do it in the daytime and at night, over calm seas and through raging storms. And the only thing they can't do at sea, of course, is breed. So they come ashore on some of the remotest islands of the world, and there they go through these long, complicated courtship dances. Albatrosses can live as long as we do. Um, some, some of them have been known to live at least to 65 years and uh, counting. Penguins, too, spend a lot of time at sea and then come ashore, often in great numbers, to nest on the shoreline in isolated places where there are few predators on shore. They do this with great panache, and sometimes with less so, mid-air collision. But these are the two projects of these majestic birds that I wanted to put together. So I didn't do this completely on my own. It was a roving tortoise project. The roving tortoise is the result of starting off in Galapagos and then heading off around the world to uh, to work on these different projects that uh, I've invented. And we're a team, we are three in the team now. Um, those are the three characters. You may recognize one of them. In the foreground is Mark Jones, who was, uh, who was my partner for 22 years, but he, we're still business partners. And his new partner, Julie. And here's Mark, I think, missing the shot, it looks like. Here's Julie playing the Pan Piper in uh, South Georgia with the King Penguin Chicks. And this is a self-portrait when I was camping in the Falkland Islands. So uh, we really wanted to get out there and follow the birds in their own environment, like I've done all the other photography, as I mentioned. And for that, we needed to spend time in albatross and penguin country. Going on a tour ship was not going to be good enough, so we actually got a sailboat, outrigged it for the, uh, the roaring 40s and furious 50s down south, and learned how to sail in waters that were very, very different from what I'd experienced in the Galapagos, very stormy seas. And this was mainly to visit the New Zealand subantarctic islands. So we spent all together, we got a permit from the Department of Conservation to spend five over a course of five years, we did seven expeditions to the five groups of the New Zealand subantarctics um, that totaled nine months at sea. And this is a view of the world um, in general where we did all of our photography for these two books. Not all of them in our boat. Our bo we only used our boat in the, in the New Zealand sector. The other places I visited in various different ways, on tour ships, on scientific expeditions, etc. So essentially, we went from the greatest flyers to the greatest divers. Penguins have been tracked down to 560 meters depth, and they may well go deeper. Penguins are a little more varied than albatrosses in shape and size. That's the uh, king penguin up to 
1.4 meters in height, and the little blue penguin next to it that's only about 20 centimeters high. They live in icy environments, in desert environments, that's on the coast of Chile, in forest environments, as I mentioned, in New Zealand. There's even a nocturnal penguin, the smallest one of them all, the little blue penguin of Australia and New Zealand. And albatrosses, on the other hand, nest on a series of islands. Mainly, about half the species nest on the New Zealand islands. The rest are mostly in the southern hemisphere. All penguins are in the southern hemisphere, and all but three of the albatrosses are too. This is the Snares Island, south of New Zealand, with the beautiful Buller's albatross. There's also a penguin there that is endemic to that particular small group of islands. And these penguins also nest in the forest. Further south are the Auckland Islands. That's our little boat to give you a sense of scale of the landscape there. Wind is almost constant, high winds blowing the waterfalls back up where they came from. That's one of the albatrosses nesting there, the white-capped albatross, as well as the yellow-eyed penguin, and a few of the other bird species and plants that grow there. The southernmost of the New Zealand islands is Campbell Island, with its own two species of albatrosses, the southern royal albatross. The uh, views of the island are spectacular, with these summer blooms of these incredibly large flowers. And this is the nesting habitat of the giant southern royal albatross, one of the largest species, and some of the courtship that they go through. Another species is the uh, light-mantled albatross, nesting on cliff edges, and one that is completely confined to Campbell Island is the Campbell albatross itself. And here I am again doing my crawl on the ground thing, trying to get the eye level shot as the albatross comes in for landing and also trying to get a few of the details. These birds have mesmerizing eyes, a newly hatched chick on its parents' feet. Another set of New Zealand islands a little bit further to the east are the Antipodes, with another species of penguin, the erect crested, as well as another species, the Antipodean albatross. Still further east is uh, a small group of islands that are literally just rocks jutting out of the sea, the Bounty Islands. And here we had a pretty tough expedition, but we were the first people to go there in seven years, and very few people are allowed to land, but we had to find a place to land and to establish a camp. So we found a spot where we could, haul, where we could climb up and haul our gear up. We had a very calm day the day that we arrived, so there's our little boat, Mahalia, uh, anchored near the shore. The next morning, that's what it looked like, a little different. So um, we were five people then. Mark and myself had uh, three volunteers along, so two stayed on board to take care of the boat and take it into shelter wherever we could find it, and three of us were on the island. It wasn't exactly a pleasant environment to camp in. We had to wedge ourselves in between the penguin and albatross nests without actually displacing any of them. But this place has its own albatross species, yet again, different one. And uh, every inch of space on the island is taken up by albatrosses, penguins, and, uh, and seals. We arrived, we timed our visit for the hatching of the chicks, just emerging from the egg. And really, nine days on this island was absolutely incredible. Totally immersed in this sea of birds and some incredible photo opportunities. And then another albatross, again, just found on a single island further north. This is in the Chatham Islands of New Zealand. This island is called, surprise, surprise, the Pyramid. And that black circle in the middle is a cave into which the albatrosses go to nest and build these giant, foot, these giant pedestals to nest on. It's quite striking because it never rains and it's relatively sheltered in there. But of course, they nest all over the island, all over the extremely steep slopes a very tricky landing to get up beyond the kelp with the waves washing up and down. And this was the bird that we were after, this beautiful Chatham albatross, nesting on these little pedestals glued to the rocks all around the island and the view looking down from the summit. Now jump across to the Atlantic, a different volcano. This is Tristan de Cunha Island, probably one of the 
well, it, it touts itself as the most isolated human community. It was founded by, um, by whalers and soldiers that were posted there during Napoleon times to guard against saving from, um, from, uh, from the French coming in to try to rescue Napoleon from Madeira. So I'm going to skip really fast now because I've really overstepped my time by quite a lot. Here's uh, the yellow-nosed albatross on Tristan da Cunha and nearby Gough Island, the sooty albatross, and another endemic for the place, the Tristan albatross. A fantastic environment to photograph, beautiful ferns, tree ferns. Amazing to see albatrosses nesting amongst tree ferns. Um, just a few vignettes of that particular part of the world. Again, the setting of where these birds nest is just mesmerizing. And the penguins there are also different. The northern rockhopper penguin is one of the most uh, gloriously um, decorated penguin. And here's one on a windy day. So you call that a bad hair day, maybe? <laughs> anyway, the Falkland Islands is one of the accessible places for penguins and albatrosses. Several different species, as you can see. Huge albatross colonies. Further south is South Georgia Island with the enormous colonies of uh, king penguins. And then finally, Antarctica. There's actually only four species of the 18 penguins that nest in Antarctica. And this is three of them that nest mostly around the peninsula. One of them, the Adelie penguin, goes further south than any other penguin. And of course, the emperor penguin that nests on the sea ice, or rather breeds on the sea ice. And contrary, at the opposite extreme is the only equatorial penguin, the Galapagos penguin, the second smallest. And here you can actually swim with penguins without even having to put a wetsuit on. And Galapagos also has its own albatross, the waved albatross, and quite a different looking one. And uh, on the other side of the world, Australia, you wouldn't really think of it as home of penguins, but it is, the little blue penguins there in large colonies. New Zealand, with its two species on the main island, South Island, the Fjordland and the Yellow-Eyed. And then the North Pacific actually has two more, three more albatross species, the black-footed albatross and the beautiful Laysan albatross, both of them nesting on uh, some of the Hawaiian islands, particularly Midway. And then the least known of all albatrosses is a rather magical bird, it's uh, the, called the short-tailed albatross, or its other name is the golden goonie. And this bird nested by the hundreds of thousands on this little volcanic island, an active volcano, near Japan. And it was harvested for its feathers during the late 1800s and up until 1930, at which point it was believed to be totally extinct. For 20 years, not a single bird was seen because they were hunted down to the last one. And then, in 1952, a few of them started coming back. A dozen birds started nesting. The island got full protection. A researcher who invited me to go there uh, spent his life actually trying to nurture the colony by planting grass. It was very exposed to typhoons and creating a second colony by, by putting in decoys in a more sheltered area with recordings. And it's really quite chilling to think that we came so close to losing such a fantastically beautiful bird. So to wrap up, I just want to say, photography for me has taught me a tremendous amount. I'd like to think that I can give back, but it has taught me how to see, how to look for subtle things all around me all the time. And well, I was, as I said, I was 16 when I got my first SLR. It was a screw mount camera without a light meter. With one, I only had one lens, it was an 83 millimeter lens, and with my first roll of Kodak color film, I took this picture, which is still my best great blue heron photo. And uh, in fact, when I was 19, thank you, I had um, a cover story in 1973 in Audubon magazine, and that was perhaps when I really started to take photography seriously. So from those early days of manual focusing for a silhouette of a frigate bird to today's rapid motor drive autofocus, I'm still shooting Galapagos. And I'm now, these last couple of years, I'm shooting hopefully with a different eye. That's what I'd like to think that it is.
different way, maybe a simpler, cleaner way of looking at things, and looking for different angles, different moments. This is a marine iguana going out to feed in the surf, one with a school of beautiful angel fish, simpler compositions, and of course, intimate views. I've started doing a bit of night photography um, of the marine iguanas asleep. I took this photo a couple of days before I came to India. So that was a behavior I hadn't photographed before, the dominance behavior of the saddleback tortoise. And I took this photo, thanks to Kalyan, a, couple of, a few days ago up in Valparai. And with that, I would like to say, having been to Kabini, the end. <laughs> Thank you.